Welcome and uh, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, we're very happy to present the 2023-24 uh, uh, California Current Ecosystem Status Report. Uh, and we'll dive right into it, but just very briefly before I dive into it, I just wanna acknowledge um, what goes into creating this report. Many of you probably know, but some of you may not. We kind of have a core team, myself, Mary, uh, Greg, Nick, Lynn, Abigail, and uh, still Chris hanging on to give us a lot of support and advice this year. That's sort of the core team that's been working on this. Uh, and again, thanks to Mary for jumping in this year and uh, and filling Chris's shoes. That was fantastic working with Mary. Uh, but I just really want to make sure everyone realizes that, you know, we're just putting together what all these other people brought to us. So we had this year contributions from over 80 uh, people covering 23 different agencies. So it's really amazing to see all these uh, pieces come to come together for this report. And it, it uh, just shows a huge range of work that goes into putting something like this together. Um, and it's just, it amazes me every year when we put it all together. So thank you everyone who contributed. I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. It's fantastic. So uh, without any further ado, let's just dive right in. Um, we'll start right off with what we want you to take out of it. So in case you fall asleep or something, you'll have this in your back pocket. Uh, but essentially our key takeaways uh, for this year are these three. And one is that we saw a sort of a mixed set of uh, signals having to do with what the ocean was like this year. Um, one of the big ones, of course, is always that we had a negative uh, PDO. That's a just an indicator that conditions are usually, uh, when the PDO is negative, it means things are cold along the coast and generally pretty good. Uh, but during the year, as you're, I'm sure you're all aware, we had a transition to a strengthening El Nino and we're currently in the middle of that fairly strong El Nino. Um, the, the second key takeaway was that uh, we had a lot of uh, big atmospheric river action uh, early in this year. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, were aware we had amazing snowpack conditions, some record breakers, especially in California, and that provided some uh, drought condition, uh, drought relief, particularly in California, not not so much in the Northwest. If you're expecting, uh, press the pound key. Oh, I'm getting some voice from someone. Um, please mute if you're trying to join on the pound key or whatever that is. Uh, then the last point here is really is that we had a very um, diverse and productive prey community this year, and we think that's really important and a key key item for this year because it really meant that going into the current El Nino uh, conditions were about, we think, about as good as they probably could have been in really, really good shape for heading into it. So we could say the preconditioning pre of the system was, was quite favorable for heading into this El Nino, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but we did, of course, it was a mixed bag. So we did have some unfavorable conditions. We had so, quite a bit of heat wave activity. Uh, it was actually the fourth largest heat wave on record since we've been tracking these things since about 1982. Uh, and it was a really big heat wave, but it, you'll see later, it didn't have as many impacts on the coast as you might think when you say something, you know, it's the fourth latest, you, you know, sky is falling, but not quite. Um, some of the other things that were kind of unfavorable was, again, that extreme weather, that big snowpack, well, that also led to some flooding, particularly in the south uh, in early 2023. So the same things that are good in some places are also not so good in others, depending on the nature of the precipitation. Um, the other thing we had that was not so favorable is we had quite a bit of uh, harmful algal bloom activity last year, which led to a lot of closures and delays in various fisheries and deaths of quite a few marine mammals, including uh, dolphins. Um, we also had, again, this is three years running now, fairly poor conditions for California salmon. Uh, and lastly, uh, we had declining catches in revenue for most sec sectors and large part of that is probably this closure of the uh, California salmon fishery we had last year. On the bright side, we did have um, quite a few good, good mixed to good signals going on. So even though the total upwelling this year was, was a little bit below average, we actually had several periods of very intense, strong local upwelling. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, we also had uh, you know, indicators of our prey field. Again, like we said in our main points, uh, we're quite good. So lipid, one of those is the lipid-rich uh, northern copepods that are sampled off of Oregon. Those were very good all year. Uh, we saw abundant forage, anchovies, and, uh, gr and juvenile groundfish all across the system in many different surveys noted that. Um, we had mixed indicators for Columbia and Snake River uh, salmon returns, so a little bit better to the north for the salmon. Uh, birds were doing well and had positive trends in productivity. And lastly, we although fishing was down, uh, crab landings were up quite a bit. So there was, was some good things that happened. So now I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, 
what was going on physically in the system. And then after I, I talk about this, then we'll switch over to Mary to talk about more of the biology. So if you'll bear with me, we're gonna go, go through this sort of month by month, similar to what we did last year. So starting in January in 23, uh, I, I roughly call this the heat wave and, and have hangover. So you can see this map on the left is showing sea surface temperature anomalies. We still had in January last year, uh, the leftover remnants of the heat wave from the previous year. We're still lurking offshore. Uh, and at the same time, we had still closures due to the demoic acid events that happened in the fall and, and winter of 22-23. Uh, so razor clams, for instance, were closed uh, until late from late 22 until actually mid-23 for Northern California and a few other areas. There's a few other problems with that. Um, then as we moved into February, we had that amazing uh, storms and snowpack that I'm sure everyone remembers. This is Mammoth Lakes on February 20th. I was actually up there skiing and I almost didn't get out of there in time and I would have been stuck for two weeks and missed the last <laughs> council meeting last March if that happened, but I made it out. Uh, and this map on the right shows this the snowpack. Uh, and it was, if you can read the scale there, it's over 200%. I believe there was a spot that had close to 270%. Uh, in California. So some pretty amazing snowpack in the south. Uh, but again, the important thing too here though is that it was not so good up in the north. It was more like 100% uh, or less or, or even 40, 50% in places. Uh, moving on into the, into the year, by March, we actually had um, some very strong upwelling. That's what this figure on the left is showing in the shaded region. You can see particularly in the sort of the middle of the system around 39 north, uh, there was this huge uh, period of very strong upwelling that was over standard deviation in, in strength uh, pretty early in, in basically through the month of February. And that's a little bit unusual to have that strong upwelling early in the year like that. Um, at the same time, we can look at how the habitat was doing. And we look at this through the habitat compression index. And that gives you an idea of how much cool water is near the coast. And when that number is high, that means things are good and there's nice cool coastal water. And so you can see across the board here, uh, during winter, uh, which is you know back in 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 January, February, March of 23, uh, conditions were good and the habitat was not compressed, so that's a good thing. But as we move on into the spring, you'll notice again the heat wave uh, reformed and was expanding. So that's this picture on the left showing the sort of average springtime uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. Uh, there was quite a bit of heat lurking offshore. Fortunately, though, you can see the coast was still cool. And you can see, based from our, our the sampling that was done off of Oregon, this is again looking at those northern copepods that are the nice lipid-rich ones that everybody likes to eat. Their numbers were quite high already in, in uh, April and May. So things were looking good early in the system, even with that heat wave lurking offshore. Uh, as we then move on into the beginning of the summer, though, it was kind of interesting because, again, here's this picture on the left showing sea surface temperature anomaly. So you notice there's nice cool water off of Oregon, Washington, but we did have this anomalous blip of fairly warm temperatures that formed just off of uh, sort of central Southern California. And that also coincided with this period of a very large uh, marine mammal uh, mortality event. Um, this map on the right is showing the sea harms model for uh, demoic acid. And you can see it was just very high probability of domestic acid all over the place. And sure enough, it was causing these uh, um, deaths and strandings of marine mammals and, and, and dolphins. And here's a picture of them. Uh, it also ended up delaying the uh, spiny lobster um, season somewhat. Uh, moving on into later summer, we did have a nice return to fairly strong upwelling. That's this picture on the left showing those, those sort of spikes during uh, July. Uh, but you got to bear in mind, we had this really great coastal upwelling. You can see this map on the right. There was this giant heat wave just lurking offshore. But thankfully, our strong coastal upwelling kind of kept it at bay and kept things rolling along for the ecosystem. So that was good. Um, but again, finally, as it has done in basically the past, the past five to six years, uh, by August, that heat wave tends to make its way into shore. And so here you see it in August, it reached its maximum size something like 8 million uh, kilometers squared areas covered here. It's a large area and it's covering something like 80, 90% of the um, West Coast EEZ is covered with heat wave uh, by August. And most of August was kind of like that. Um, at this point, we were also aware that El Nino was on the horizon. Uh, and something you can see here is this is the Southern California Temperature Index that Dan Rudnick from Scripps puts together. And you'll notice it's plotted here as that black line versus the red line over time. And it's a, it's basically this black line is telling you what the subsurface temperatures are like off of um, line 90 in the Cal Coffee, um, sort of San Diego area. 
And this index actually tracks quite well the ONI, which is a, a index tracking the strength of El Nino. And you can see it tracks it quite well. And again, if you look to the far right of this map, you'll see that uh, we are already seeing some indication of um, some El Nino, in, the weather patterns associated with El Nino influencing that region. Uh, moving on into September, again, continued uh, offshore heat. Uh, and this is when we start to see a compression of the habitat. So basically the sort of east-west uh, corridor of cool water basically disappeared in the fall of 23. And that's what you can see the big drop in the fall uh, habitat compression index, that graph on the right. Um, moving right along into October, November, again, tip, this is a pattern that we've seen year after year. Typically in the fall, after upwelling shuts down and the heat waves come in, we tend to also get a lot of demoic acid events, which yet again caused uh, closures to uh, uh, razor clam and some uh, problems with Dungeness crab uh, meat. Uh, this year, apparently the meat quality was down there. There was a slight bit of um, demoic acid, but mostly it was also a meat quality issue. And there was issues with uh, whale entanglements, presumably caused by um, more interaction between the whales and these traps. Again, remember the last figure I showed, the uh, habitat was compressed, so the whales tend to be closer to shore and interact with the traps more. And then we roll on into December uh, of just this last year, and we're already in, well into the El Nino signal. So this picture on the left is showing sea surface temperature patterns, the anomalies, and that is a very typical pattern for an El Nino with uh, just warm water right up along the coast all the way up and down the entire coastline all the way up through to Alaska down through Baja. So very typical uh, pattern and as we all know with El Nino typically comes storms and sure enough we got some massive uh, atmospheric rivers uh, back in December and this was a little clipping I actually stole from a newspaper on the right here that was talking about these two particular events that caused quite a bit of um, severe flooding uh, both up in the Pacific Northwest and then um, down in Southern California. So just, I, I wanna give a quick summary and then I'll hand it over to Mary to dig into more of the biology of what was happening in the current this year. Uh, so just to sum it up, I think this, this few graphs will kind of show the, the, the story I'm trying to tell here, which is that um, the graph on the left is the beauty index, which is both upwelling combined with the idea of how much nutrients are effectively getting brought into the system. And you'll notice that for the far south, this graph in the lower left, there wasn't much going on. Uh, the far north, there was some activity, but in the middle, you really see this big sawtooth pattern. Uh, and that's kind of the key thing here, because for all three of these locations, the total amount of upwelling was actually average or actually quite a bit lower, especially in the north, uh, than the typical average total upwelling. But the savior this year was these really strong and fairly long periods of upwelling. So these peaks, these mountainous peaks. And this is somewhat like last year, although last year, if you remember, the saws had a lot more teeth to it. So that we had shorter and higher frequency events, but they weren't quite as strong as these. This year, we had these longer sort of higher peaks uh, going on, especially right in the center there. And that leads to what we see in the map in the middle, which was this nice, cool, upwell water all along the coast, even though we had the big heat wave offshore. So uh, thanks to... Uh, nice weather patterns giving us that uh, upwelling to keep our system cool and keep the productivity going. And the result is that we had, uh, you know, our third third sort of main point was that this led to a robust prey field. So here's the map of, of krill, and you'll notice the krill are kind of centered around this sort of Oregon, Northern California region where there was plenty of this nice strong upwelling. Uh, and we also had sardine to the north, uh, plenty of rockfish in the central region and anchovy to the south. So quite abundant prey sources throughout the system, uh, in part likely due to this uh, nice strong upwelling signals we had uh, on various periods during the summer. And that's all I have to say. I'm going to hand it over to Mary now, who's going to lead us through uh, some more of the biology. Take it away, Mary. Great. Can you hear me? I hear you good. Yep. Great. Thanks, Andy, and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be presenting some information on the ecological conditions in the California current in 2023, and we'll try to connect some dots between different components of the food web and also uh, between the ecology and the physical conditions, similar to what Andy was, um, was doing earlier um, over this over the past year. Next slide. 
To start, I'm going to present some information on the forage community in the northern region of the California current. The figure shown here shows the results of a cluster analysis that was applied to the data from the Northwest Fishery Science Center's Juvenile Salmon and Ocean Ecosystem Survey, or JSOS for short, that took place last June. This cluster analysis helps us identify shifts in the forage conditions over time. The colors uh, indicate the relative catch per unit effort, where red indicates the forage species was abundant, blue indicates that they were rare, and gray indicates that they were close to their average abundance. The horizontal bars separate the clusters of typically co-occurring species, and the vertical bars represent breaks in the, the, the assemblage structure between years. Overall, the results of this analysis indicate that the forage community composition has been relatively similar over the past six years in the Northern California current. The figure also indicates that in 2023, the community was characterized by a high abundance of juvenile sablefish and abundance uh, juvenile salmon, including yearling coho, juvenile chum, and sub-yearling chinook. However, it was also characterized by a low abundance of yearling chinook and juvenile sockeye salmon. Next slide. <clears throat> The high abundance of sablefish in the JSO survey aligns with sablefish catch data from the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey and the Juvenile Biomass Index estimated from the, that trawl survey data. The abundance index shown in the figure here on the right suggests another strong recruitment year of sablefish in 2023, uh, similar to that in 2022. Next slide. Also of note, uh, as Andy mentioned, was the high prevalence of juvenile rockfish in the JSO survey. Rockfish are collected but not sampled quantitatively um, by the JSO surface trawl and are noted in terms of their relative prevalence instead. Um, and in 2023, the prevalence of juvenile rockfish was above average. It was actually the second highest estimate since the survey started in 1998. And in addition, the proportion of rockfish, juveniles, and seabird diets was above average for some seabirds in Washington and Oregon. For example, this figure shown here shows an increase in rockfish in rhinoceros auklet chick diets at Destruction Island off the outer Washington coast. Next slide. Um, as Andy was, uh, was uh, talking about earlier, these mixed but favorable indicators of the forage community are likely to connect to the physical conditions in the Northern California current last winter and spring. Um, again, there were intermittent periods of above average upwelling in, in, in winter and spring that led to fairly productive conditions. And the subsurface and sea surface temperatures were uh, relatively cool or neutral until the temperatures started warming up in midsummer. In addition, the time series of the liver-rich copepods along the Newport hydrographic line indicates that their biomass was relatively stable throughout the year. However, the biomass anomalies from spring and summer were near average, uh, suggesting average feeding conditions for pelagic fishes off of central Oregon in 2023. Next slide. This, this next slide shows the cluster analysis of the forage community in the Central California Current, which is based on data from the core area of the Southwest Fishery Science Center's Rockfish Recruitment and Ecosystem Assessment Survey. Similar to the Northern California Current, the forage assemblage in this region has also been relatively consistent over the past several years. In 2023, this community was once again dominated by a high abundance of adult anchovy, which has persisted since 2017, as well as an increase in adult sardine, young of year rockfishes, and young of year hake. There was also a low abundance of young of year anchovy, young of year sardine, and krill. Next slide. And in the Southern California current, the forage assemblage that is sampled through the Cal Coffee program was characterized by high abundances of larval anchovy and mesopelagic California smooth tongue in 2023. We've seen high abundances for both of these species over the past few years. Hake larvae were also above average and at their highest abundance since 2011, and the abundance of larval sardine main, remained below average despite increases of adult sardine uh, seen in nearshore waters in the Southern California bite. Next slide. Again, as Andy was showing earlier, the central and southern regions of the California current also experienced periodic upwelling in the winter and spring, which helped spike productivity in these regions. And that habitat compression, the habitat compression index for these areas was high in the spring and winter, indicating there's a good amount of cool and productive habitat to support the forage community in these areas in, in late spring and early summer when these surveys are out sampling for them. Next slide. <clears throat> The high abundance of adult anchovy observed in the Central California current was also observed during the Southwest Fishery Science Center's Coastal Pelagic Species Survey. The map on the top right shows that in 2023, northern anchovy comprised most of the samples south of Fort Bragg. Pacific sardine from the northern stock were caught from Cape Flattery to Cape Blanco, and those from the southern stock were caught in nearshore waters south of Morro Bay. 
Also, as shown in the figure on the bottom, the central stock of anchovy reached close to 2.7 um, 2.75 million tons in 2021 and has remained highly abundant since then. The southern stock of sardines has also increased in recent years in the near shore waters of Southern California, as I had mentioned previously. Next slide. <clears throat> Also new to the report this year are coastwide estimates of krill abundance from the biennial joint U.S. Canada Pacific Cake Ecosystem and Acoustic Trawl Survey, which is conducted in June to September and spans from Point Conception to British Columbia. As we know, krill are an important prey source for managed and protected species, and time series of their abundance in the ESR had previously been limited to the Trinidad headline in Northern California. As Andy has showed earlier, this map on the right indicates that most of the krill in the system were located off northern California and Oregon. Less krill were observed south of Cape Mendocino. Cape Mendocino. And also the figure on the bottom indicates that um, while there was a, a high abundance of krill in, the, in that central area there, um, the total krill abundances in 2023 were the second lowest since the start of the time series in 2007. And this matches the low abundance of krill observed on some of the other surveys in the California current. This lower total abundance could be related to shifts in ocean conditions seen during the summer season, including the warm okay. water um, moving inshore off Washington coast toward the end of the survey. It could also be related to predation by hake and anchovies or, or other predators out there as well. Next slide. The diets of the high, highly migratory species and seabirds that are collected by the commercial and recreational fishermen and our other partners along the West Coast indicate that predators were capitalizing on the abundant and diverse prey items in the ecosystem. For example, the figures on the left show that the proportions of anchovy, sardine, and Pacific hake in the diets of bluefin, albacore, and swordfish have been well, well above average in the past two years. And the figure on the right shows the high consumption of anchovy, sardines, Juvenile rockfish and seabird diets in Central California current, including rhinoceros auklets, common murres, and brant's cormorants. Next slide. <clears throat> the abundance of prey has likely supported the above average productivity and at sea densities observed for many seabirds in the northern and central regions of the California current. For example, the two figures on the top right <clears throat> show above average and positive trends in productivity anomalies for common murres and rhinoceros auklets, which have been consuming a high amount of anchovies in the recent years. Also, the figures on the bottom right indicate that counts of sea lion, live sea lion pups on San Miguel Island in 2023 are among the highest counts in the time series, suggesting there's a lot of prey available um, to the sea lions during their preg pregnancy period from November 2022 to May 2023. However, the pup weight did decline in 2023 to slightly below average, which suggests that high quality prey for adult females may have been less abundant in their foraging areas during the summer in 2023. Although this is unexpected given the, the high abundance of anchovy and other forage that, that we've observed in, in the system. Okay, next slide. Okay, for the next two slides, I'm gonna shift from talking about the forage community to highlighting updates from the uh, salmon stoplight tables. This slide shows the Northern California um, stoplight table, which summarizes many physical and biological indicators that support qualitative outlooks of Chinook salmon returns to Bonneville Dam and smolt to adult survival of Oregon Coast um, coho salmon. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this table, but I'll just go, go through it once again. The colors in this table represent a given year's um, indicator relative to a reference period. Um, in this case, the reference period is 1998 to 2020. The green and blue colors rep represent indicators that are greater than one or two standard deviations above the mean. Orange and red represent indicators that are one or two standard deviations below the mean, and the yellow means the indicators are within or plus or, within plus or minus um, one standard deviation of the mean. And the blue arrows in the box are highlighting that Chinook salmon from smolt year 2022 and coho salmon from smolt year 2023 represent the dominant adult age classes that are returning to the Columbia Basin um, in 2024. So when looking at this table, we see that in 2023, most of the physical and biological indicators are yellow or near average, which suggests that juvenile salmon experienced moderate ocean conditions in 2023. The basin scale climate and atmospheric indicators were above average and consistent with cool and productive conditions that are often favorable for juvenile salmon. However, the local physical conditions were moderate or less favorable than the larger scale indices. So overall, the ocean conditions suggest that uh, suggest average survival for coho returning in 2024, and the conditions in 2022, which were also mixed, suggest average returns for, 20, for Chinook in 2024. And in addition, a quantitative model uh, developed by Brian Burke at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center that, that uses as based on these stoplight indicators, 
estimates slightly above average survival for most Chinook returning to the Columbia Basin uh, this year. Next slide. <clears throat> the remaining stoplight tables I'm going to show are were developed for the California salmon stocks. These time series go back to the 1980s, but um, you'll see that in the ESR report. But here I truncated them um, to a shorter time period. And I'm showing all three tables at once because the habitat conditions for 2023 smolts were fairly similar across all <coughs> the three stocks shown here. Overall conditions were mixed but improved from 2022. Adult spawning indicators and spawning temperatures were relatively poor across stocks. Out migration improved for all stocks due to the better snowpack uh, last, last winter um, and therefore the better flows and temperatures. In general, the freshwater conditions were near or above average, whereas the marine conditions were below average due to unfavorable uh, sea surface temperatures um, and the MPGO, MPGO index. And I want to mention that a key message stemming from these stoplight tables is that in terms of risk classification, as defined by the Ecosystem Workgroup's risk classification rubric, the ecosystem conditions experienced by California salmon stocks going to sea in 2023 are of substantially increased concerns. And moreover, the habitat conditions have been relatively poor for multiple life stages um, of these uh, California stocks um, over the past three years. And so the ecosystem information provided in these stoplights could really be helpful in providing valuable context uh, for decision making around salmon abundance forecast this year and in subsequent years. Okay, next slide. The final piece of ecological information that I will highlight today is on whale entanglements. Based on preliminary data, the confirmed whale West Coast entanglement reports were below the peak years of 2015 to 2018 and slightly lower than 2022. Humpback whales continue to be the most common species reported, followed by gray whales and confirmed entanglements of killer whales uh, increased after 2020 and have remained at one to two whales per year. Next slide. <clears throat> I also want to highlight this really nice uh, figure shown on the right that was created by Chris Free, uh, Stephanie Moore and colleagues for this year's e ecosystem status report. The figure um, shows the spatial temporal history of, of closures and management restrictions uh, in the U.S. West Coast Dungeness crab fishery from 2015 through 2023 uh, due to demoic acid, whale entanglements and other concerns. So here the solid black lines indicate state borders and the dashed lines indicate the border between the northern and central California management zones. And the gray shading indicates the commercial Dungeness crab fishing season in each region. And one of the take home messages from this figure is that in recent years, the majority of management actions impacting the crab fishery in California were related to whale entanglement risk, whereas demoic acid contamination and poor body condition has mostly impacted the fishery in Oregon and Washington. Okay, next slide. So now I'd like to provide a few highlights from the ecosystem status report with respect to human activities and well-being. Next slide. And I'll start with uh, fishery landings and re fishery landings and revenue. So in 2023, total coastwide fisheries landings declined by 20% and landings for most harvest groups declined as well. The two exceptions were landings from crab and coastal pelagic uh, species fisheries, which increased from, from which increased from the previous year. Crab Crab landings um, uh, increased significantly in, in 2023, as you can see, there's a by 65% there on this on this slide here. Over the past uh, five years, Pacific whiting landings were above the long-term average, and CPS finfish and HMS landings were below their long their long-term averages. Coastwide commercial landings also have been below the average the past few years, and notably, the uh, salmon fisheries in California were closed in 2023 due to load returns. Also of note, not shown here, but is the, the increase in the coastwide recreational landings for the third year in a row, uh, which has brought those landings to the, to the, back to the long-term average. Next slide. <clears throat> the to total coastwide fisheries revenue declined by 32% in 2023, although total revenue uh, remains within one standard deviation of the long-term average. Revenue also decreased for all um, individual harvest groups in 2023. Um, although crab revenues uh, remained high despite the decline from 2022, whereas revenue for other harvest groups, including non-white and ground fish, CPS and HMS remained greater than one standard deviation below their long-term averages. Next slide. 
So one measure of human well-being that we have been presenting in the ESR over the past few years is fishery diversification. The idea here is that diversifying fishing across multiple fisheries or regions could help increase revenue and reduce variability in revenue and possibly buffer vessel owners from fishery shocks. The CCIEA team has been measuring multiple types of fishery diversification, including revenue diversification, which measures how revenue is spread across species groups. And in general, revenue diversification has been declining for the West Coast fishing vessels since the mid-1990s, which can be seen in this figure on the right, although we note that California, Oregon, and Washington fleets did see some uh, small increases in diversification in 2022 relative to 2021. Next slide. In this year's report, we also present information on non-fishing income diversification for the first time. As I just mentioned, West Coast vessel owners can reduce some in their income variability and financial risk by diversifying their fishing portfolio, but they may be even more effective at reducing this risk by diversifying income from non-fishing occupations, which is also referred to as livelihood diversification. This type of diversification can reduce risk if non-fishing income sources are not affected by changes in the fishery and they can be increased when fishing income is low. Northwest Fishery Science Center scientists surveyed vessel owners with commercial um, revenue from West Coast fisheries about their non-fishery income in 2016, 2019, and 2022. And some results of the surveys are shown here. So for example, the figure on the top shows that vessel owners in Washington drive a higher percentage of household income from fishing than those in Oregon and California. The figure on the bottom indicates that since 2016, there has been a decrease in vessel owner households that are 100% dependent on income from fishing, and there has been an increase in households deriving less than 50% of their income from fishing. This shift in livelihood diversification may be connected or partially connected to the overall decline in fishery revenue diversification that I showed on the previous slide, which poses uh, more risk to the vessel owners. Next slide. The CCIE to A team has also updated the social vulnerability scores for commercial and recreational fisheries for communities in five regions, uh, shown here, including Washington, Oregon, and three regions within California. These are all depicted by the different colored polygons in these figures. The figures are based on the most recent available data, include the five highest scoring communities for commercial and recreational fishing reliance for each region. The communities in the upper right quadrant of both plots are those with relative, relatively high social vulnerability and high commercial reliance, high commercial um, fishing reliance in the figure on the left and high recreational fishing reliance in the figure on the right. <clears throat> So the figure on the left shows that Portland, Port, Port Orford, Oregon, Tokeland, Washington, and Westport, Washington had high commercial reliance and high social vulnerability. These findings tie together with the previous finding that West Washington vessel owners derive a high, higher percentage of household income from commercial fishing, followed by Oregon and then California. The figure on the right shows that Bethel Island, California, Winchester Bay, Oregon, and Westport, Washington had high recreational reliance and high social vulnerability. And, and overall, the figures indicate that there's a higher vulnerability of commercial and recreational fisheries in Washington and Oregon than in California. Next slide. And lastly, here I'd like to briefly highlight some work that Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Center scientists and our partners have been doing to advance our understanding of the potential impacts of offshore wind energy on the West Coast. Last year, the ESR featured seven fisheries indicators that described variation in ground fish bottom trawling activity in regions under consideration for offshore wind um, energy development. And this year, we introduced six ecosystem indicators of spatial variation in oceanography and productivity. They include upwelling, primary and secondary productivity, juvenile rockfishes in hake, and juvenile groundfish um, habitat. And these are shown in the figure on the left. And also we present a spatial suitability analysis based on these six, six indicators for areas off of Northern California being considered for offshore wind development in 2024. And this is shown in the figure on the right. Um, and overall, these analyses can serve both near and long-term science and management needs. For example, they may be able to identify hotspots of productivity that can be used to inform siting analyses of offshore wind and wind development. And they can provide baseline conditions that can be used to test whether farms are, the wind farms are impacting these ecosystem components over time. Next slide. And I'll, I'll hand this back to Andy. Cool, thank you, Mary. All right. So um, 
I'm just going to, before we hand back to Mary for the final uh, synopsis of everything, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, what we might be expecting uh, for next year. So um, right off the bat, we can take a look, of course, at you know, the current time right now. These are maps for the uh, current uh, SWE, snow water equivalent, and the current drought conditions. So unlike last year at this time, uh, we have not had a huge uh, influx of snow just yet. So as you can see this map on the last left, things are lo looking pretty uh, low in terms of SWE. Uh, however, drought is not doing nearly as bad. So drought in most cases is neutral along the uh, most of the West Coast. So things are looking good for drought. And this is a little bit how you uh, think things might be under El Nino uh, with some high pre precipitation air in areas, but not as much snow. So we're already seeing this sort of El Nino uh, wet but warm uh, conditions. Uh, looking ahead to see how this El Nino is going to go, because this is one of the biggest uh, forces in terms of controlling our climate in this entire region is what's going on with uh, El Nino. Uh, currently, this is our forecast for um, for how this is going to go, and it's already looking like we will be dropping out of El Nino fairly rapidly. So, whereas this is technically uh, classified as a strong El Nino, uh, it will most likely be a short event. So it looks like this uh, El Nino will transition uh, not only to a neutral condition, but it's fairly likely that we will transition back to La Nina uh, sometime in midsummer and at least by the fall. And that's, you can see the transition basically from those red bars to those blue bars on this uh, graph on the left. Um, and just to show you what's behind that, the uh, graph on the right is all the different uh, forecast models. Uh, so different sort of initial assumptions about how the the physical system evolves and you can see there's general agreement in most cases that the uh the el nino the enso oni index will go from its current positive value down to a negative value indicative of la nina so this will be back to conditions similar if you recall we were in three years uh, essentially back-to-back -back la ninas before we went to this current el nino and we're most likely going straight back to la nina by next fall um, as far as also what's going on right now with uh, heat waves and the, and the temperatures, you can see, again, this is the most recent image I, I put together for what's happening with heat on the West Coast. You can see we do still have this uh, very warm coastal waters all up and down the coast. Uh, this is the anomaly, not the absolute temperature, but the anomaly. So we're looking at two to three degrees uh, Celsius above normal for most of the coastline here uh, with some offshore heating. So the development of next year's heat wave. Uh, then this map on the right is uh, provided by Mike Jacox and his group uh, to look at the uh, forecast for likelihood of maintaining heat waves. Uh, and you can see that uh, most likely we will continue to have this uh, coastal heating from El Nino, but also some offshore heat as we uh, go forward through uh, the year. And uh, although we always like to say, you know, every El Nino has a little bit different flavor to it. Uh, in many respects, this El Nino is looking a little bit more like like a typical El Nino, as I said before, in terms of its timing and, and impacts. Uh, but there is quite a bit we know about uh, El Ninos. And if you'd like more detail on this, you can look into uh, our Appendix E. Uh, which has a little broader discussion, but just in general, we, we've put together this uh, list of some of the uh, impacts we expect to see. If you want to see more details, I suggest you go check out our appendix on that. Um, and now I will hand it back to Mary for the final conclusions. Take it away, Mary. Okay, great. So in summary, the ecosystem conditions in the California current over the last year were mixed, but included many favorable signs. Period periods of strong upwelling provided cool and productive coastal habitat that supported a diverse and abundant forage base for predators, including the high, highly migratory species and seabirds. And these favorable conditions leading up to the current El Nino may help buffer the system against some of the anticipated um, impacts that, that Andy has described. And we note that there were some indicators that of concern, uh, including the multiple HAP events that, that caused marine mammal strandings and disrupted the shellfish fisheries. We also saw some mixed trends with human activities, including the overall decline in commercial fishery landings and revenue. Also, salmon fisheries were closed in California in 2023 due to low returns, and the outlook for salmon returning to California is relatively poor for, for 2024 as well. However, there were some positive signs, such as the significant increase in landings in the crab fishery and the high revenue in that fishery, um, as well as the, the increase in recreational landings to their to the long-term average. Next slide. <clears throat> 
And so what to expect in 2024, well, as uh, Andy just mentioned, the current El Nino is strong. It's predicted to be short and returning to neutral by summer. Nearshore waters are likely to be warm until May and offshore waters may continue to be warm past May. And in the summer or fall, we expect the system to, trans to transition uh, or likely transition back to a La Nina conditions. Next uh, slide, please. And in looking to the future, we're excited about the expansion of the information on human well-being and the ecosystem status report. And we'd like to get to a point where we can make stronger connections between ecosystem conditions and their impacts on the fishing communities. Based on several years of data, we've learned which regions and communities along the West Coast are more or less socially vulnerable, as shown in this map on, on the slide, and which communities are highly reliant on commercial and recreational fishing. So if we can better um, better uh, link this uh, knowledge with ecosystem conditions, we may be able to provide insights on which communities might be most impacted by climate variability, uh, which may allow them to better mitigate or adapt to those impacts. Next slide. Actually, I'll just go to the next one. You can skip this one, yes. Okay, so, and lastly, the California uh, current has been reasonably resilient to climate and ocean conditions in 2023 and in some prior years. However, it's likely that this uh, system is gonna be able to sustain this re resilience uh, indefinitely, especially with climate change. But the CCI team is well positioned to support efforts aimed at better understanding the impacts of climate change on West Coast species, and also quantifying the risk posed to West Coast fisheries and communities. So this year's climate change appendix highlights some of these efforts <clears throat> coming out of the Future Seas project and the ground fish to climate change and communities in the California Current Project, also known as the GC5 project. And briefly, they include the seasonal forecast of marine heat waves, projections of long-term shifts in the distribution and abundance of ground fish and CPS species, and the social ecological vulnerability and climate risk for ground fish and CPS fishing fleets. So we encourage you to, to take a look at this appendix when you have a chance. Uh, it's not included in the main, main report, but it's included um, as a supplemental report in the briefing book. Okay, next slide. So thank you all for uh, joining today and for your attention. And Andy and I and uh, other folks on the IA team would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Mary and Andy, and that was really, Wonderful. I always enjoy these every year. And um, I just, I see there's a blue hand up. I just had a quick comment. Um, Katie Pearson is the first person up and um, a question myself, if you don't mind indulging me. Um, the first comment is that um, every, you know, so 20-ish years ago, I was working on um, overfished ground fish species rebuilding and um, you know, it always does my heart good to hear that uh, the juvenile rockfish levels are up, that we're having an abundance of those, and um, it just makes me really proud of the West Coast Fishing Fleet and of the Pacific Council. That's why we collectively have such a good reputation nationwide is because, um, you know, the fishing fleet was willing to do the hard work of rebuilding ground fish um, in a way that helps put us in a better position um, as we're facing climate change. So with that, then my question is, um, one of the last slides that Mary spoke to in the first round of Mary's talks was uh, an image that is figure 5.1 in the report on social vulnerability. And I think that's a new image this year. I'm not sure if it is. Um, could you maybe go to that slide and explain the blobs a little bit? I, I, you know, there's a lot of information going by pretty quickly, which is necessary, but um, I wasn't quite sure I understood what the different blobs were. And in case other people were in the same boat, um, I would appreciate a little bit longer explanation. Thanks. And then Katie, um, I'll call on you next. Is it, is it this one? Is that the right one? Yes, it is. And then Katie said her question's also on this slide. So Katie, do you want to ask your question and then um, they can answer both? Sure. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, thank you, Mary and Andy. Um, so I, yeah, my question was just, uh, you said briefly what these um, uh, cities, not cities, uh, communities were, like how, how you derive them. 
well, I'm just wondering about Cloverdale, to be honest. But um, if you could just explain kind of what the uh, what the different communities are, that would be great. Thank you. Great. So I think I can tackle the first question, and then Karma Norman and Connor Lewis Smith are on here, and they've they're the ones that have done this great analysis and created the figures. So I'll let them chime in as well. Um, but Yvonne, if you're talking about those polygons, the polygons are there are, are really to help call out those different regions on the West Coast, the five different regions, um, just trying to trying to show like uh, overall in general, which of those regions are, um, you know, more reliant on uh, commercial fishing or recreational fishing or, you know, have higher social vulnerability. Um, but if Karma or Connor want to hop on and potentially address Katie's question a bit more about the communities, that would be great. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes, thank you. This is Karma. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, it's always a little bit, um, I guess, interesting or surprising to some sort of which communities appear. I think Cloverdale shows up, if you'll notice on the right, because it's part of the recreational reliance um, set of communities. So it's based on the way we, uh, the variables we include to sort of think about how communities might be more or less um, reliant on recreational fishing. And that's why Cloverdale pops up in that um, green blob indicating the Oregon communities. I don't know if that's a sufficient answer to your question. I can certainly speak more to that if you, if that doesn't um, satisfy your curiosity on that one. Yeah, that's, that's what I figured. Um, so I just, how did you, like, what are, what are these communities representing? They're the top five or I don't know, yeah, that, that's top, very quickly, sorry, thank you. Yeah, the, the top five for each region. So in green is Oregon, blue is Washington, and then we break apart California into three, um, you know, north to south regions. And the idea, idea here is we have, you know, measures for, you know, a, a much bigger set of communities, but it would be hard to convey all that information for every single community on the coast. So we just sort of include the top five every year. Um, and I will say that this is the first year we've added recreational fishing reliance um, back into the uh, report after a several year gap because of sort of lack of good data to sort of create these index measures. Um, and they're for recreational, they're a little bit different than commercial. So, um, you know, because we don't have the same kind of uh, landings and revenue um, information that we can directly connect to, a, to the community scale. So recreational is a bit different. It's more based on um, businesses um, that are associated with recreational fishing in each community. But yeah, it's each each polygon is the top five for each of those five regions. Okay. Um, did that answer questions, Katie? If so, we'll move on to Jessica. I think her hand is next. Oh, thanks, Yvonne. But uh, Lynn, I think, got to my question in the chat. Mine was a, a follow on on that of Cloverdale. Like, what other ports would be kind of encompassed under that Cloverdale uh, commercial, like looking at the commercial side, that Cloverdale um, labeling? But Lynn touched on it as Pacific City. So I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, I'm having a little trouble driving this Ring Central right now, so I'm not sure if there are any other hands up. But um, I would say if you are not a member of the Ecosystem Work Group and you want to ask questions, you should raise your little blue hand, please, because we've got plenty of time. And if you go to the reactions bar at the bottom of your screen, there's a blue hand, hand raise feature right at the the top of that selection of reactions. Okay. Um, oh, Arlene, hi. Um, you're up next. Thanks. But if you're talking, I can't hear you. There we go. Yeah. Hi, Yvonne. Yeah, I was having trouble unmuting. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Um, I always look forward to these as well. So I have a question about the slide that you showed about the offshore wind and ecosystem indicators. Um, I was a little unclear about, I understand, you know, these are the indicators um, 
the normalized value for the indicators, but then looking at the combined suitability slide or image, um, I'm a little confused as to what this is actually representing. Is it is it representing the indicators combined and then the the relative you know the suitability for wind based on the values of the indicators, which doesn't really make sense to me. If I think about, you know, how does primary productivity and secondary productivity have anything to do with offshore wind? So just trying to understand that suitability slide a little bit more. Thanks. Mary Randy. Yes. I can I can take a stab at it and then I'll uh, see if Kelly Andrews is on Kelly Andrews is on the call too because he has led this analysis as well and he can probably chime in more about about um, this analysis. He's more more information on it. Um, but yes, the combined suitability index does come is based on those six indicators, and the idea is that um, using the the, the the combined information, you might be able to, to identify which habitats might be more or less suitable for uh, offshore wind development. So, for example, if there are some habitats that are are really uh, great for rockfish or um, or hake or juvenile groundfish uh, habitat. Uh, and just like a highly productive, productive region, have a lot of prey there, um, then we might not want to put in offshore wind uh, um, development there, just in case it has a negative impact on 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 those indicators. Um, Andy, if you'd like to chime in, or Kelly Andrews, if you're on the call and you'd like to chime in, uh, please do so as well. Yeah, I don't I don't have anything to add. We'd have to refer this back to Kelly for more details. No, it's okay. Thank you. I, yeah, it, it's the reverse of the way I think about the term suitability. I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of the wind itself, you know, the, the wind energy development being suitable in mm. that, but it's, it's, it's actually really the way I think about it is it's unsuitable for wind. Right. But, but the colors indicate that. So yes, thank you. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> A little slow this morning. Thanks. <laughs> No, it was a good um, clarification, Arlene. I appreciate you um, being willing to ask about that. I think that's one of the sort of lovely surprises of the IEA process has been, um, you know, we are much farther along in understanding the potential interactions between um, future offshore wind development and our ecosystem than we would have been if we had not been going through this process of providing ecosystem status reports to the council year after year. It sort of, you know, taught all of us a lot about what's going on out there in our ecosystem. Okay, um, let's see. Anyone else with any questions? Arlene, your hand is still up, which is totally fine, but I don't see anyone else's hand up. Oh, Deb Wilson Vandenberg. Okay, Deb, do you wanna go ahead with a question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, um, oh, good. Okay. Uh, first one is, uh, I think, am I right that this is put in links between the different sections of the report and the figures and everything to be able to go back and forth? Because it's certainly the first year I remember that and I really appreciated it. So thank you for that. And great rate report and presentation. Um, I had a question related to socioeconomic in information and vulnerability. And my question is, has there been any thought to whether it's possible to pile together for a given area and part of the coast? Is it possible to pile together the different lengths of fishery closures through the season on top of each other as another estimator of vulnerability and i can explain more if that didn't make sense deb thanks for your question i'm going to call on karma again to to help address address your question or, or connor um see if they've been thinking how they've been thinking about this yeah i think it might just be me i think connor had another meeting at 10, but um, it sounds like what you're asking is um, to 
sort of think about vulnerability in terms of adding a kind of a geographical layer of where the closures were happening? Is that what you're suggesting? What, where they are and within a region, when you add a bunch of different closures for different fisheries or reduced fishing seasons, um, how that, uh, what that might look like in terms of relative vulnerability for that port area, that port area or region. In other yeah. words, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I mean, it's it's an interesting um, point and request, and I think there's ways we could think about building it into our vulnerability measures. Um, you know, it, it would, I guess, require the folks who contribute the social vulnerability measures um, to kind of work more with um, some others in the report to think about where those closures are and how they how could they could be tied to individual communities. But it's definitely a, a worthwhile. Um, pursuit, I would think, um, and I would say that, like in in years past, we've had suggestions like this. For example, developing social vulnerability measures at the scale of the county, which more closely aligns with the kind of port level geographies that um, some of the folks at the council are more familiar with. Um, so we've we have responded to these kind of requests in the past. Um, it's something I'd have to think about a little bit more, because right now the measures are built on kind of you know, demographic data and other data from the census that sort of identifies various um, attributes of the community that might make them socially vulnerable. And they're not necessarily directly linked to closures at sea where, you know, you might have multiple communities affected similarly by those closures. But but I appreciate the, the request and it's got me thinking. Um, I'll also chime in here as well. Uh, Deb, if you look in the report under the human well-being section, there's a, a, a part um, on the salmon fishery participation networks um, that was built on from last year. And it, it shows some of the uh, potential impacts of the salmon, California salmon fishery closures on different communities on the West Coast, kind of showing you know which communities were uh, more vulnerable to those closures because of their high dependence on uh, the salmon fisheries and maybe were less connected to other fisheries. So. Um, you know, take a look at that analysis and um, that was uh, led by Jamil Sampiri. And I think if you have any additional questions, you could reach out to him about that as well. Thanks, Mary. Um, that actually was what prompted me to, to think about it even more broadly. So I appreciate you circling back around to that. I'll, I'll talk to Jamil. Great. Thanks. Okay, let's see. Um, I see one smiley face, but I don't see any blue hands up. Is there anyone else who has any questions for Andy or Mary? Okay. Just give it a minute, and then I think we will take a break and come back here at 10:25, so that we can prepare for a 10:30 presentation on H2. All right. <clears throat> if you have a question on H1 and you're not able to find your blue hand, which is totally understandable, because I find switching between these different platforms confusing, <laughs> and you want to speak up. I'll just be quiet for a minute and see if there's anyone who has any questions, but uh, is maybe not on as great a platform right now. Okay, I don't see anyone speaking up, or I don't hear anyone speaking up. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Corey. Corey, did mind. you have a question or comment? Well, since no one else does, I just, uh, Andy, um, on the El Nino effect, I'm trying to formulate my question in a way that doesn't sound too too dumb, but you said something about um, the, the typical pattern is, is that there's warmer waters near, near to the shore. So what, what happens when upwelling, um, you said there was decent upwelling too. Does that is that persist the the above average temperature, or, or does it cool down to flow normal? Can you just talk about your sure, your sure, sure, uh, how that works? Sure, no problem, Corey. So, 
yeah, typically you could still you could still have upwelling, but it's going to be a little bit capped off. So what tends to happen is the stratification is stronger. So you've got this warm layer kind of sitting on the top, right? And so you could still have the winds may still blow the same as strong as they have in other years, but with that warm sort of lens of of water sitting on top of that, the upwelling is usually just not as effective. So, for instance, we'll look for say next year. Um, there might be a bigger difference between those two indices we use. You know, we have one that's called QD, and that's sort of the physical transport. And there's one that's called beauty, which is, well, how much of that physical transport actually leads to nutrients getting up into the fog zone and doing something, right? So, so for instance, during El Nino, you might see a little difference, more difference between those two measures. And so you'll tend to have less productivity as a result. Does that uh, kind of answer your, your question? Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, okay. that's good. Okay. Always good to hear. Yeah, you. yeah. Oh, right. So, oh, right. I guess yeah. when I say it's typical, I, I'm, I'm meaning that it looks more like some of the El Ninos of the past, not counting really. We, you know, we had this fairly strong El Nino in 2016, but it was a little bit of a different uh, beast because really that one kind of had a lot of things going on because it followed right after. You know, most people are aware of the blob, that really big heat wave that lasted for like almost two years, right? So that was a, I can't emphasize enough how different conditions are going into this current El Nino, which looks like it's going to be short versus that last large El Nino in 2016 we had that came right on the heels of, you know, two years of constant coastal heat wave activity and then just slammed right into a into an El Nino. So that was a pretty different condition. So that's why I think we kind of, one of our take home points from this year is, is that it, we're sort of guardedly optimistic about the system being fairly resilient and getting through this El Nino with, with not as many impacts as we had probably during that last 2016 El Nino when it was, you know, again, right on the heels of heat wave, heat wave, heat wave, right into El Nino, right? So pretty pretty different um, sort of preconditioning of the system uh, this year leading into this current El Nino versus the last one. So that's that's why I'm saying this, this situation to me is, looks more like a little sort of a typical El Nino that's kind of on its own, not surrounded by so many bad conditions ahead of it. I can ask one more than dumb, dumb question. Um, no, thank you for that. And, but so um, why, why are the warmer waters just near to shore? Or maybe I miss, I'm taking what you said too, too far. What do the, the deeper waters not warm up to the same degree during the El Nino? That's that's right. Yeah, that's just that's just the, the typical pattern of of what happens with the. Um, again, again, it's not it's the, it's an anomaly in water temperatures. Not necessarily the temperatures are warming up. They're just warmer for this time of year than they normally would be. Whereas the offshore waters tend to be, on average, what they usually would be. So it's just a, usually it's changes in stratification or a change in sort of the depth of the thermocline. You can think of it that way as well uh, in the coastal region. Okay. Well, if I see you in Fresno, I might corner you if you can't escape and ask you some more questions, but thank you. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Andy, for that reply. And then Greg Kruzikowski had an addition in the chat. But um, with that, unless I see other hands up, I'm going to call a time. And it's 1013, and let's be back at 1025. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, particularly Northwest and Southwest Fisheries Science Centers, Mary Hunsaker, Andrew Lysing. Thank you both for your presentation. And um, we will look forward to getting back together on H2 in just a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye. We're not on at 8.55, may not know this, but um, figure two in our report has some mistakes and that's the figure of the CPS management process. So um, I'll show you an improved corrected figure on the screen during my presentation and we'll get a corrected um, report up in the briefing book ASAP. Okay. And I apologize in advance for my voice yet another cold, um, <laughs> which seems to be the fate in my household this, this winter.
Okay. With that, let's get rolling. Today, uh, well, here now in this 1030 time slot, we're going to be talking about agenda item H2, which is the Ecosystem and Climate Information Initiative. Thank you for joining us. And I uh, just want to let you know that our written report is available on the webpage for this meeting, and it's also in the Council's briefing book. So ecosystem initiatives are developed under the Council's Fishery Ecosystem Plan. And this slide shows how the uh, three ecosystem agenda items work together at this meeting. And I think somebody is not on mute. So if you're not on mute, please check yourself. Um, and we just heard the annual ecosystem status report, which is agenda item H1, which we've been receiving for more than 10 years now. And that has quietly but brilliantly educated our council, advisory bodies, and the public on just what our ecosystem is, and does, and how it changes over time. So this is the briefing for agenda item H2, the council's fourth ecosystem initiative on bringing ecosystem and climate information into fisheries harvest setting processes. This initiative is uh, intended to follow these three basic steps uh, of reviewing the incorporation of ecosystem and climate information in the council's harvest setting processes. And we um, have completed that review, um, looking at the need and appropriate timing for additional FMP specific ecosystem and climate information. And we've completed that with this report. And then looking for where there is a need for additional ecosystem and climate information, develop clear pathways for it to be used in setting scientific uncertainty and harvest policies. So that's uh, where we're going from here. So the council last discussed this initiative in September 2023. Summarized their direction from that meeting at the top of page two of our physical report. As you'll see from the rest of our report, the Council has scheduled the Scientific and Statistical Committee's Ecosystem Subcommittee and Groundfish Subcommittee to review the groundfish harvest science and management process for decision points where the ecosystem and climate information might be useful in harvest setting and annual or biennial management processes. And those joint subcommittees met together in September 2023 and had a detailed conversation about the initiative. They had this interesting and creative discussion that resulted in their posing four possible pathways for using ecosystem and climate information in the biennial groundfish harvest setting process. In particular, they came up with ideas for different pathways for moving this information into the council process. The first being um, informing the choice of scientific uncertainty, SIGMA, when an assessment is adopted. The second being informing the policy choice of risk tolerance, which is P-STAR, when an assessment is adopted. Uh, the third was informing how sigma or P-STAR might vary over the course of a projection interval between assessments and direct specification of the ABC. Of those ideas, the EWG felt that number one and number three were the most doable in the near term. That number two would place a higher time burden on the council itself without having much potential effect on harvest levels one way or another. And that number four would ultimately be the goal of thinking more deeply about the effects of the ecosystem on managed stocks, but that we weren't really there yet scientifically for that approach to be useful for many stocks. In late October, the EWG uh, was fortunate to meet with the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel and Management Team at a GAP meeting. And during discussions with those advisory bodies, they suggested a fifth pathway using ecosystem and climate risk tables to inform stock assessment prioritization. Also during that meeting, we worked with the groundfish advisory bodies to update what's now figure one of our report, which details the pathways or on ramps for ecosystem and climate information into the groundfish management process. <laughs> Then in January, the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team and Advisory Subpanel uh, graciously hosted a meeting with the Ecosystem Work Group, where they came up with Pathway 6, which is coupling the Annual Ecosystem Status Report with risk tables on a few CPS-specific indicators to help shape coastal pelagic species harvest setting, and Pathway 7, which was updating the Ecosystem Considerations Chapter of the CPS Stock Assessment 
and Fishery Evaluation Report, also known as the SAFE Report. And the figures that um, will be in the revised briefing book, the groundfish figure was okay. This is the figure that we had talked about with the groundfish management team and groundfish advisory subpanel and corrected and updated from their comments. And this is the figure that we had worked through with the um, CPS management team and advisory panel and corrected and updated from their comments. And uh, thank you once again to Jessica Watson for taking the lead on these uh, diagrams. So, uh, so that gets us to today. It was sort of a, a meeting filled winter and uh, we got a lot of information and had some great conversations with these advisory bodies. And the next steps in the um, system initiative process will be to finalize any changes to the on-ramp processes illustrated for groundfish and CPS in figures one and two of our report. Uh, begin working with the science centers to draft a risk table for pilot CPS species or species group to help illustrate how that might work with the CPS harvest setting process. Uh, begin to work with the science centers to de develop a framework to illustrate how a risk table might be used to inform the choice of scientific uncertainty. When a groundfish assessment is adopted, which pathway, which was pathway one from the SSC's subcommittee's report. And then we would run that draft framework past the groundfish advisory bodies and the SSC for their initial review and comment. So uh, as usual, we have many more details available in our H2 report released for this meeting and in the council's briefing book. We tried to follow the council's January uh, committee of the whole wishes and put our, our actual recommendations up front. But those next steps that I just listed are at the very end. And uh, we may discuss this meeting further at our meeting next week in Fresno and the council itself will take up ecosystem issues on Saturday, March 9th. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions or uh, punt any questions to the rest of the ecosystem work group. Thank you so much. So to ask questions, um, you can raise your blue hand using the reaction screen. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, I would say the questions are open to anyone from, you know, advisory bodies or the public. The ecosystem work group has been working a lot on this recently, so I suspect they don't have actual questions. Okay. Then I will pause again for any questions or comments from anyone who has difficulty raising the blue hand, but can still unmute themselves. Okay. Well, you guys are a pretty easy crowd. Um, ecosystem work group, is there anything that you want to comment on as you, you know, do that you feel like we need to talk about um, next week in Fresno? Go ahead, Corey. Thanks, Vanya. Yeah, I guess we'll. As to what we talk about in Fresno, you know, the the ideal would be, which we never seem to be able to hit, is get feedback, hear what others are thinking, reflect on things ourselves, and then see if we have any new thoughts. And yeah, I guess people, um, I'm sure, people, it's all it's still sinking in for folks. But yeah, I would just say to the other advisory bodies and everyone else, if you have thoughts. Um, it's and and we're working on draft statements or whatnot. It'd be 
nice if you could contact um, Kit or Yvonne or, or just all of us and let us know if you have uh, feedback because that, that helps our deliberations for sure, but understand the lack of discussion today. Jessica, did you want to add to that? <laughs> Yeah, I echo what Corey said, and I would just add that there also seems to be some connection between this initiative and um, the ESR review topics that are under the previous agenda item. So H1A Supplemental CCIA Team Report 3 kind of talks about how there could be some committee meetings and timing, and so feedback on that too would be really useful um, as we move into uh, being in Fresno in person at the EWG. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Greg. Oops. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to hear you guys. I mean, I, I see the four possibilities that were outlined there. And um, it seems to me that both Sigma and I mean, Sigma and P star were highlighted in, in, in you know, the first three in one way or another. Um, I, I guess P star was only in, you know, one of those. But, the, you know, number four was ABC. And essentially, it seems to me that both Sigma and P star are indeed what inform the ABC. And so, I would like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, the thinking on that and, and why you're thinking that um, it, it's going to take more time to get to that stage um, when indeed the others will, it, it seems, still play into um, uh, modifications to uh, uh, the ABC if you're dealing with uh, uh, Sigma and P star? Well, um, I would defer to the scientists on the EWG, but I would just say that you um, just answered your own question, which is to say that um, we wanted to choose a pathway that we thought was doable and um, that you know, we could get done in the near term, knowing that whatever pathway we chose, ultimately we'd be able to get through to pathway four. But if we started out aiming for pathway four, um, that was gonna take a while to get there. So um, I would just say, ask uh, Kiva, Mary, Jamil, did I summarize that correctly, if a bit briefly? Yeah. I think that's fine. I, I think just to be clear, like the, the pathway floor was that the SSC would directly specify the ABC. Um, and so the council wouldn't choose the P star, the SSC would sort of like jointly choose a Sigma and a P star because they, um, the, the Sigma and the P star interact to determine the size of the buffer. So if the P star is large, the effect of Sigma is small, for example. Um, and so the idea of this proposal was just to have the SSC determine the, just determine the size of the buffer um, itself. Um, I, I'll also say that I think this is Will set. And so that did seem like a pretty large departure from how we currently operate and would take um, a, a while to socialize. Um, but uh, Will, I think it was Will Satterthwaite's idea, and I think he's on the call. So I don't know if he wants to chime in. Uh, thanks, Kiva. Yeah, um, and I just put something in the chat. I mean, I think you captured it all well. Um, although, you know, as I pointed out in the chat, I'm definitely not a lawyer, but it does seem like pathway four would just be consistent with what the MSA says, which is basically that the SSC sort of sets the ABC in most cases. Um, but I mean, I think you're right that I mean, the, the sort of the reason for proposing that pathway, in addition to either going through just Sigma or going through just P star is that you really, you know, the ABC is the cumulative effect of those two things. And so, um, in some ways, you know, 
you don't want to sort of double count considerations to, into both P star and sigma, but you also don't want to sort of let considerations cancel each other out in some, some cases. Or just, you, know, you don't want some considerations to be completely missed, and you also don't want some considerations to be double counted. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Jessica, I saw you had your hand up, but you put it down, and I think maybe you added information in the chat. And then if that's the case, uh, Doug Fricky, oh, thank you, Jessica. Doug Fricky is up next, and then Michelle Conrad. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, thank you. I apologize. I missed the first couple of minutes of your presentation. Hey. I'm on the uh, HMS AS uh, advisory panel, and I didn't hear you mention anything about looking at HMS species. It sounds like from what you're trying to do with groundfish, you really need a full bucket of scientific information, which we don't have for most of our <laughs> HMS species. Uh, did you mention anything about HMS, or are you planning to do it with anything in HMS in here in the near future? Well, thank you for that question, Doug, because it helps um, sort of reorient people um, to the initiative. The council decided when they took up the initiative that um, we would start by looking at groundfish CPS and salmon because the HMS harvest levels are set internationally. Um, and um, in September, the council asked us to concentrate on groundfish and CPS for this next um, report here in March. And then if you look at our report, we do include, let me see, I think it's on page five. Uh, yes, a little section on ecosystem and climate considerations in the salmon management process, where we sort of note ongoing work in the salmon management process. But this initiative does not cover HMS. Um, although we have talked a bit in the background about, well, you know, there's got to be ecosystem and climate information that could help with bycatch uh, management in the HMS fisheries. So um, stay tuned. Thank does that you. answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, go ahead, Michelle. Thanks, Yvonne, um, for the presentation. Uh, it was <laughs> entertaining as always, and I appreciate the, the slides, the creativity. Um, I had a question, and I'll apologize in advance if these if my questions are more. Um, relevant for the SFB and, and not for the EWG, but with regard to uh, the SFB statement that you have on the bottom of page two about the need to tailor the risk tables for their intended use, um, I was wondering if you had any further insight on that or if the EWG has had a discussion about how you might um, tailor or change the risk table relative to um, pathway one versus pathway three. That is the task that we are suggesting the council assign to us for the next round of discussions on this initiative. Okay, um, thanks. And, and if I may, um, just a follow up related question is. Is it your understanding that for pathway three, a risk table would need to be developed first, or could pathway three um, proceed without a risk table? Oh, I'm not sure. I think it was our sense that, uh, and that it would be best to proceed with one of the pathways. We don't have the sort of time or person power to pursue multiple pathways at once. And that the um, pathway that sort of we get um, most utility out of soonest was pathway one. So I don't know if you were asking because you were hoping that we would pursue two pathways at the same time, um, but uh, there would be different, probably different factors in the risk tables, depending on which 
pathway is chosen. And so we want to make sure that we have the right risk table for the right pathway. Okay, thank, thanks, Yvonne. That, that's helpful. So it sounds like the intent is um, continue with the risk table, but then identify either pathway one or three as the as the intended use, and then um, and then proceed from there. So thank you. Uh, just to be clear, the ecosystem work group is identifying is recommending pathway one to get that going. Uh, Corey Niles, you're up next. Uh, my comments just a little bit out of date. Now I was going to. I think Greg probably got the answer you and Kiva gave her. But I don't think we're saying the pathway for Will's idea doesn't have merit. It's just it would just take longer, be more involved. Is really what we were saying. I think, but. That's yeah, just saying what you and Kiva said, I think in a different way. Or, okay. Or. okay, uh, thank you. And uh, I don't see any more blue hands. Okay. Someone just put their hand up um, as I was clearing reactions. So, oh, okay, might have to up again. Is there or just speak up. Else? Who wants to comment or ask questions? I think it was probably just me fumbling with the buttons. Okay. Okay. All right. And if there's anyone who wants to speak up and can't find the right buttons to do so, you to raise your hand, please go ahead. Okay, so I put it in the chat uh, at the beginning of the meeting, or at the beginning of the presentation, but I'll just add it again. Um, let's see. Here's our report, and it has uh, many more details, and I definitely um, encourage you to take a look at the comments of the SSC Ecosystem Subcommittee back from um, their September meeting and the reply from the SSC. Those were really helpful and I uh, just want to express some extra thanks to all of the SSC members who participated in those. Uh, they help sort of straighten us out and uh, give us a path forward as we were moving along. Um, and just see that Deb Wilson Vandenberg raised a hand. Did you finish what you were saying? Yes. I, oh, okay. Um, and this is a totally lame question, but at the very beginning, you mentioned corrections to something in that supplemental report. Is it, is, is your next one going to be H2B supplemental revised report, or how will we know that you've included the revised one? Oh my gosh, um, that is a question <laughs> for, Kit, for Kit Doll. I'm not sure how we label these reports. Kit, how, what's our, are we gonna delete the report with the incorrect CPS graphic and just sub in a new one, please? Couldn't do that? Um, essentially, yeah, I'll consult with our staff in terms of whether we relabel it as uh, Deb was suggesting, you know, or sometimes we'll put revised supplemental report one or whatever. So people know that it's the updated version. Um, but I, so that's probably what we'll do. We'll just change the label with, and then we'll include the corrected figure in it. Okay, thank you. I think that would be uh, the least possible confusion for an already confusing situation. Okay, so I think the next item on our agenda starts at 11.15, and that would be agenda item H3. 
which is the Climate and Communities Initiative follow-up. So you know, for this, for the next initiative, well, it's not the next initiative, it's the next agenda item, we'll be going back in time to Initiative 3. And I'm going to um, give a little bit of background on that initiative, sort of quickly go through the history of what we did under that so that people who, um, like me, needed a little bit of reminding of <laughs> What happened five years ago? Um, you'll have that reminding when we when we get to that presentation time. And unless I hear raised hands or comments from anyone else, let's see. We'll just take another break until eleven ten, so that we can start the H three presentation at the eleven fifteen time that we noted in our agenda. Okay. Thanks, Kit. Would you put up the the break? Slide. The uh, slightly different color scheme for this H3 agenda item, just to um, help myself in visually noticing the differences between the two. But uh, we are now working on agenda item H3, which is the third ecosystem agenda item at the council's upcoming March meeting. And this is a little bit unusual. These are, we're looking back at the third ecosystem initiative and we're looking at the follow-up tasks from the climate communities initiative. And so, um, this slide is slightly modified from my last presentation. Um, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking back at the Fishery Ecosystem Plans Climate and Communities Initiative. There were many, many ideas generated during that process. And um, the council asked us to go through a process to mine those ideas um, to help them think about work going forward. And since the third initiative began in late 2017, I thought it would be best to sort of give a very rapid fire history of that initiative to remind everyone of what we had accomplished during that initiative. And um, just providing here the goal of the initiative, um, pardon me, to provide flexibility and responsiveness in our management actions to near-term climate shift and long-term climate change. Now, um, the work of the initiative fell into sort of three big parts. And the first objective to the initiative was an education process to supplement the ecosystem status report in that um, it was not only about what was happening in any given year in our ecosystem, but also about the quality of information and analyses we have for our ecosystem. We had a seminar series to cover those intersecting questions of what we know and how much we know, and those are available on the Council's website for this initiative. And then those are sort of coupled, as I mentioned, with the ecosystem status reports, which have evolved quite a lot since we first started putting them out in November 2012 to the ecosystem status report you heard about under agenda item H1. And the centers have been significantly upping their game over time. Our second objective was to complete a multi-year scenario planning process. Essentially, this is a large-scale strategic planning and think-a-thon where council members, advisory body members, stakeholders, and others thought carefully about each of the fishery management plans and what we might want from our fisheries going forward. Over 2018 through 2021, we met in various combinations and recombinations of people in the council process with different types of expertise to sort of develop these stories about the potential future of our ecosystem. And these stories were neither completely scientifically rigorous, nor were they pure tall tales. Um, and the uh, the council had developed an ad hoc climate and communities core team to work with the ecosystem work group and the ecosystem advisory sub panel, but also with advisory bodies from all four of the fishery management plans and with the SSC and the habitat committee. So basically everybody was involved at one point or another. 
on a range of issues and concerns uh, to uh, think about the future of our ecosystem under climate change. And while we tried to be careful about scientific details as much as we could, it became pretty clear that our facilitator wanted us to experience different ranges of emotions about the scenario. One scenario was to make us overly optimistic, two made us sort of pause and think in detail, and the fourth was sort of to scare us into thinking more. Uh, and that's and that's how I would sort of characterize the experience of those scenarios. And um, the sort of super intense thinking uh, happened from December 20th, or excuse me, December 2020 through February 2021, where um, we held sort of the final sets of conversations for regional workshops to sort out, close out the strategic planning process, getting folks together with interest in Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Southern California. So separate uh, workshops for each of those groups held online. And you'll note from the date uh, winter 2020 to 2021, that was a time when a lot of people were at home and doing a lot of thinking. And the worksheets from those workshops, which are available from the council website, are really just full of amazing ideas. Which brings us to the third objective for the climate initiative, which was to actually use some of those amazing ideas to improve the flexibility and responsiveness of our management actions to near-term climate shift and long-term climate change. In September of 2021, the Climate and Communities Core team shared some of those ideas with the Council, and the EWG has been tracking those core team ideas since then, most recently updating the Council in September of 2023. But the Council wanted to go back to those regional workshops and take a closer look at the ideas generated in the, under that third ecosystem initiative, which then brings us here to March in Agenda Item H3. You'll see in our report for this agenda item that we first discussed the Council's Inflation Act funding application. We covered that in our report because we knew that we would be submitting this H3 report early in the briefing book process. And we're trying to be helpful to Council staff and uh, Council members and the committee as a whole working in January to develop their Inflation Reduction Act uh, application. Appendix A, which I'll detail on the next slide, uh, and then Appendix B, I'll just say as another update of our September report on the Climate and Communities Initiative ideas that the Council has implemented to date. But Appendix A is the heart of our report uh, for this March meeting. Over the winter, the EWG went back to the worksheets from the regional workshops and combed through them for more ideas for our Council. We separated them into ideas for the council process, ideas on communication, and ideas on science, since those seem most within the council grasp. There are also lots of ideas in the worksheet that we didn't cover, um, uh, things like uh, marketing strategies in our different climate scenarios, port infrastructure needs, et cetera. So I encourage you to take a look at those, uh, maybe using a keyword search for different ideas in case you are interested in um, doing a little thinking about planning for climate change in your own area. Under the council process heading, there were ideas ranging from things that the council could ask staff to do right now uh, to more comprehensive reviews of how the council conducts its business under the different fishery management plans. And our recommendations for this agenda item are again at the top of our report and they're fairly simple, but they would require support from the council to implement. We just want them to look at those ideas, choose something and start working on it. And, uh, you know, we have suggestions, as I mentioned, for the Inflation Reduction Act proposals, and those, of course, have already been submitted, but we can sort of integrate ideas from the Climate Communities Initiative into that work going forward, and then um, maybe also consider research and data needs as we're, um, as we're going forward and think about some of the research and data needs questions raised during the scenario planning process. And with that, I'll just close by reminding you that the Council will be discussing this and other ecosystem agenda items on Saturday, March 9th in Fresno. Thank you.
Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Hi, Louie, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Yvonne. Um, I'm the co-vice chair of the uh, of the GAP nowadays, and I, I just wanted to ask you if you have any feeling for what kind of input do you need from the advisory bodies on this? Well, so um, it would be just great if the advisory bodies would focus on Appendix A of our report. And um, what we did was we went through those workshop slides, and there were Oh, gosh, there were over 100 of them for the four um, workshops combined. And we slimmed those down to, I think it's two or three pages. So if you guys can read those two or three pages of Appendix A and see if there's anything that strikes your interest and to ask the council to start working on, um, that would be great from the advisory bodies. Okay, that's very helpful. It gives me a gives me a way to go here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Corey. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first of all, awesome job, Yvonne. That was a good, a great summary, and um, maybe just saying it in a different some highlighting things for like uh, Louis, I guess, and and thinking to the committee of the whole discussion, which will. Be coming up. I have the, the the main goal here is really, um, I think the, the EWG is is more, as a facilitator for fans of basketball, the point guard. We're trying to we're trying to get um, help jumpstart these uh, these type of um, analyses questions within each advisory group within each FMP. So it's really what what are the advisory bodies want to 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 know and do about and get about climate change and, and ecosystem resilience and all that. So Yvonne said it well, but just reemphasizing the whole goal here is to make this helpful to to um to the regular FMP processes. And I think yeah there's there's ideas in Appendix A, but those aren't the only ideas that people might have with what the needs are within each, each FMP. So yeah, again, I think I would really um, characterize what we're doing here, trying to jumpstart those uh, with, within within the FMP advisory bodies like the GAP and GNT and the counterparts and the other FMPs. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Louie. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Uh, Corey Writings. Hi, Yvonne. Thanks for that uh, helpful presentation. Um, I have a clarifying question. At the end, you noted, and I think this is in your report too, in one of the, the first three bullet points, um, it says something at a minimum, address those ideas in future, future situation summaries and other analyses of council actions. And I, I have to admit my own ignorance here. I'm trying to see how that would work. So I was wondering if you could provide a little bit more background about what the EWG was envisioning um, in future situation summaries or other council actions or what that could look like. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate you asking that. Um, let's see. So first, I don't, I'm sorry for not remembering if I did this five minutes ago, but I'm going to just pop the um, report into the chat here. And then uh, if you look on page three of the report where we come to Appendix A, um, the very first suggestion on council process, and I can also put this in the chat, is um, when the council is thinking about preliminary preferred or final preferred alternatives for their management actions, um, the staff analyses of the alternatives presented to the council should evaluate and discuss whether alternatives would create more or less flexibility for our fishery participants. So it's a pretty simple, straightforward idea, but um, 
there was a lot of interest raised during the and communities initiative sort of background discussions happening between different different folks about you know how do we just get the council to pay attention to some of this stuff um, and think about it as part of their normal discussion processes does that help it does thanks very much Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, and then, um, Kit, I'm going to put you on the spot for a